Welcome back, everyone. Hi there. I'm Brian. I'm an engineering manager here at Figma, and I support the design systems team. Hope you all love the variables launch this morning. Uh, it is incredible to be here in person with you all, and shout out to all the community members tuning in from around the world. We saw that there are 50 plus cities with Friends of Figma watch parties. That's so incredible. Love that. This next session is a double feature all about unlocking designer and developer collaboration. First, we have Maria joining us from the Uber Design Systems team. She's going to share with us how, today how to build components and design systems processes that won't make your engineers cry, hopefully. <laughs> I heard that she has in her documentation a line that says, if you don't follow these guidelines, I will throw potatoes at you. If that's not someone who cares about design systems processes, I don't know who is. I'm thrilled to welcome Maria to the stage. Hello, everyone. How's everyone's config going? Yeah, yeah? Amazing. Well, this is my first config being here in person. And what an honor to be here on this stage and share this talk with everyone in this room. This is a lot of people, can I just say. And I can't even imagine how many people are watching online. So thank you so much for being here. So my name is Maria, and I'm a senior product designer at Uber, where I work on our design system base. My journey into design systems started on actually very early in my career when I got the opportunity to design an Android UI kit during my first product design internship at Shazam. When I joined Uber almost four years ago at this point, I was actually initially a designer on the money team. Um, and I was initially designing consumer-facing features. However, I very quickly found myself in some interesting conversations. I was collaborating with some engineers on how we can use a read API to standardize some payment method display names. I started collaborating with our content designers to see how we can create a messaging framework with composable content blocks. And of course, we're at a Figma conference. I also started looking after our um, payment-specific library. So I pretty much had like a little Marie Kondo moment where I was like, OK, creating engineering documentation, creating just documentation specifications brings me so much more joy than creating user journey maps. Um, so I started going to engineering stand-ups, joining like architectural discussions, bug bashes. Um, and I was just trying to absorb as much information as I possibly could to bring back to my designs. So fast forward, driven by my growing passion for creating high quality, scalable design frameworks and my curiosity of what it actually takes to implement them, I joined our design systems team. And let me be honest, I used to think that attaining a high bar for craft in a feature team would naturally extend to a design system as well. I believed that once we nailed the so-called engineering handoff, everything would fall into place seamlessly. However, my journey into the design systems realm has revealed a whole new set of challenges that helped me to understand that quality is a dynamic reflection of how your craft aligns with the specific context and goals of your work. I've learned that design systems quality lies in the invisible. While visual components and design language are often the first ones to be evaluated, it is the underlying code base where the integrity of the design system is truly tested. As our systems mature and our components evolve to encompass greater complexity and flexibility, the importance of upholding component integrity beyond our design tools becomes paramount. When we prioritize only the designer experience and neglect the needs and the perspectives of engineers, we risk not only creating inefficiencies, delays, and sometimes inconsistencies, but the adoption and success of our design system as a whole. So today, I want to talk about how we can empower ourselves to embrace the inherent technical nature of our design systems by expanding our understanding and expertise and pushing the boundaries of what a designer can and should own. 
So it starts with understanding the ecosystem your design system is in, because your context dictates your solutions. Some questions to ask yourself are, how many platforms is your system actually supporting? Are your code components built on top of existing libraries, or are they completely custom? And how are they actually being rendered to your end consumer application? So since its creation almost five years ago, the base design system has become the single library that's being used across all of the products that exist within Uber. And today we power two platforms, Base Mobile and Base Web. And as you can see behind me, within Base Mobile, we support native components on iOS and Android, as well as interface description language models, also called IDLs, that power our server-driven UI framework. And as the complexity of an ecosystem grows, so do the number of touch points and interactions that are required to ensure the consistent implementation of a single component. And each touch point, or let's face it, the absence of one, becomes a potential source of miscommunication, inconsistencies, and errors. Today, components in Figma are designed to capture hundreds, you can see how many hundreds, snapshots containing variants, states, and behaviors. And the output is what we consider handoff. It's this collection of very, very detailed specifications and documentation that does help our engineering partners when defining the rest of the component logic. So as our own ecosystem continued to grow and our components reach critical mass, so did the scale of the system and the customers it was serving. And that inherent scale forced us to rethink how we view our design system. Even the smallest misalignment between design and engineering became amplified exponentially. With thousands of designers and, 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 develop, and de developers using base, quality and stability were expected, exposing the cold reality that our existing process of creating and validating components was no longer serving us. When working with engineers, we could easily point out things like visual inconsistencies, incorrect accessibility behavior. However, the expectations of our components were shifting. They were moving from general component availability, hey, do you have a button? Yes, we do, to a lot more specific questions around implementations. So it was very evident that we had to evolve from designing one-dimensional systems. So what does that mean? Now, every component in base follows a distributed structure model, which consists of the six layers you see here. Designers, like most of yourselves, would play a key role in shaping the visual and behavioral structure of the presentation layer. Think defining dimensions, layout containers, variations of those layout, layout containers, states, colors, and typography. This layer, in turn, impacts our consumer API. Now, the way you would design a Figma component is often actually the single reference point that your engineer will have when they have to decide how someone would actually interact with the component on the platform. So the rest of the layers, like rendering, logic, data, and definition, are usually very unfamiliar and oftentimes actually intimidating to a designer because there's a technical barrier between designing the presentation layer and actually defining the logic that drives it. However, these are very critical pieces of the puzzle when it comes to the overall integrity of our components. So, the big question, how can we then establish a stronger technical advocacy within our team that helps empower designers in understanding and engaging with the technical aspects more effectively? For us, using Figma, Figma to maintain our design system means that the gap between design and development on the presentation and the consumer layers are getting smaller by the day. Component variants and properties, as well as auto layout, were essentially built to mimic web development technology, and they're pretty easy to align to mobile. Figma can also sometimes unknowingly help us contribute to the definition layer, which would cover configurations of component properties contained in other layers of the model. 
For example, when you expose a nested instance versus when you actually keep it private, this is a very good way to define the relationship between two elements in a single component, something that's actually really standard when you're writing I IDL models. And while having powerful design system authoring tools is super valuable, using them by, their, by themselves does not quite guarantee you a quality API design. Tools alone cannot really address that lack of technical understanding or the language barrier we just mentioned between design and development. And like most problems in design systems, this one too starts with naming. If you've ever worked with a design system, I'm going to assume that a lot of you here have, you know that about 80% of our work is naming things, right? And then the rest of the 20%, you're like, yeah, this is where we do work. We draw rectangles. We argue about border radius, all of those important things, right? No, be real with yourself. You're probably renaming things, right? So in that spirit, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I feel like this is the right time that I told you. I think design systems naming is very broken. Ah, now you're not laughing. Stings a little bit, right? Right? You're like, ouch, my naming convention. Uh, let, me, let me explain a little bit more. So many systems, including our very own, have placed a very strong emphasis on consistency in naming conventions. If it's in the Google sheet, it's the law, right? Potatoes are coming your way. I'm going to throw them at you. Now, consistency is important for maintenance, obviously. It's important to have predictable component API interactions, but it can definitely make your engineers cry a little bit, and we don't want that, right? So why? When you overly prioritize rigid standardization, it creates not only naming, but component architecture that can be ambiguous, they can just lack contextual awareness, and is sometimes completely disconnected from established practices within engineering. Let's take a look at a couple of examples from our own library. So here we have the menu item component. This menu item component has a class property. Now let's pretend I've never seen this component and I'm just a user who's trying to understand what class means in this case. Just by looking at it, I can kind of see what it is, but I would probably like take a look at the definition of this property, which in this case would be a higher level grouping associated with a component. Not very helpful, is it? No? No. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look at the actual component and we can try to see if we can reverse engineer it. Okay. Okay. Great. This is, this is helpful. So it turns out that this wonderful property contains the keys to not one, not two, but five different types of menu item components, which are completely different entities. Not great. Okay. Let's take a look at another one. Another example is the behavior property of the select component. This is one I'm personally responsible for, so I have every right to roast it. Behavior, in this case, let's take a look at that definition too, is Described as how the component behaves most of the time. Incredibly helpful, I know. Let's look at the component. Cool. This is default. Great. So I would think that I'm looking for the opposite of default. Anyone? Any idea what that is? The systems team is not allowed to speak? Anyone? Not default. Great. Well, that would be the logical one, but no, let me show you. Searchable. Makes total sense, right? Right? Searchable. Uh, yeah, I'm sure every single customer who's ever opened our component is like, yeah, that's searchable. So all of that to say that striving for consistency should not come at the cost of usability. And one way or another, we've all heard of design tokens, variables, whatever you want to call them. We were all in that keynote in the morning. So one of the promises that design tokens make is that they create this shared language for designers and developers that can be used in the tools that they feel mo most comfortable in. So the question became, why haven't we applied this methodology to our APIs? Right? And this question has been something that has become a topic of discussion within our team in the past few months. And it sparked curiosity and drove us to explore and experiment further. So we're still in the process of iterating and refining, but I'm really excited to share our initial findings with you today 
igniting conversations, and hopefully inspiring other design systems teams to embark on similar journeys. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, Maria, this is another naming conversation convention, isn't it? Are we going to eventually break out of this? How sustainable is this? And how is it going to stop my engineers from crying? And the million dollar question, is this another Google Sheet that I have to make? <laughs> all very good questions, all very good questions. So there's a lot of benefits to API tokens. Obviously, they can help you streamline your naming. They can make your components easier to use across the board. But more importantly, the true value of them is that they can establish a foundation for cross-platform behavior and feature parity. API decisions can be abstracted into the three tiers we're all familiar with from design tokens, being primitive, semantic, and component. Primitives remain highly reusable and use case agnostic building blocks to define common attributes. Then on the semantic layer, we can start introducing constraints when it comes to things like content or data types. And finally, all the way up at the component layer, we can handle any use case specific details in context. All individual tokens still have a type, which would be derived from our original naming convention classes. But this type actually leaves room for more flexibility when it comes to representing the different component attributes in our consumer APIs. And there are two significant differences when it comes to design tokens and these so-called API tokens, their values and their aliasing model. Now, traditional design tokens represent simple design decisions, right? And they're usually tied to a very static value data type, so something like a string or an integer. In the world of APIs, these individual big building blocks are so much more complex and carry a lot more functionality right off the gate. And what this does is creates this need for more composite tokens, even at that very low primitive level. In order to be able to translate, oh, can we go one back, please? There we go. Uh, in order to translate to more complex data structures in the code base. And when it comes to aliasing, it's no longer required to directly alias tokens of the same type. Here, we can use different types of tokens to build out logic to drive the end token value, enabling us to define dynamic, dynamic relationships between attributes. And there are various ways you can incorporate API tokens into your workflow. Going back to the examples of naming convention pitfalls, one of the most obvious areas for improvement is component API usability achieved through better naming. A recent example from our library is one of our text and password field components. While initially they were two separate entities, when we took a closer look at the engineering implementation on all of our platforms, surprise, surprise, it was just a property that was actually natively available to all of our developers. So what happened then is on the design side, we were able to abstract this little property, right? This little token. And this token was then applied to our main text field component and was even extended to the pin code. We can also use these API tokens to evolve how we communicate with engineering, both during the initial phases of concepting of a whole new component or just new functionality, as well as providing the detailed specification to implement it. For a component like button, we all love buttons, we can describe and define the expected individual element behavior through multiple layout and size API tokens, which are one of the most reusable types across the platform. Now, for a less trivial component like file uploader, things become a little bit less straightforward. So a file uploader, in general, at least in our library, is part of the wider input family meaning from a structural perspective, it already has two elements coming in from that family. It has an input label and an input hint. And it also has two just regular standard old Joe components for buttons that will handle user input. So far, so good. Complexity starts to arise when we start thinking about actually displaying the files that the user is uploading. What are the pieces of logic that define how different file types are being displayed? And then 
what logic are we going to use to adjust the layout depending on the amount of files that are being uploaded. This is a moment when you realize that when you have so many unknowns, you can't really define this API on your own as a designer. Um, and it's a moment where you realize that they're very dependent on the timely and close collaboration with engineering. Components at their core require thoughtful compromises, both through continuous learning and adapting your approach. But how can we make compromises when our existing processes don't set us up for success? Our current way of working had a high delta between design release and code complete. New components would be released in Figma every week in order to help us shift the previously disjointed visual design language to base. And due to the lack of a real staging environment, it was also a way to get feedback from feature design teams and iterate on our solutions. Now, we could have done a better job of communicating with our engineers that a new component or functionality had been added into the library. And in hindsight, we weren't spending enough time together, and the artifacts we were using for asynchronous collaboration were not providing the information and level of detailed specifications that engineers required. The component sticker sheets that engineers were referencing in Figma became increasingly misleading as the reduction in visible variance was not matching to their reality in code. And then on the other hand, there was design documentation. In order to keep that digestible for actual design consumers, we wouldn't really include advanced specifications that were related mainly to engineers. And all of this ended up creating a little bit of a chaotic atmosphere that slowed an already constrained engineering pipeline. Our process had also created a little bit of a false perception of how well the system was adopted. All new designs in Figma were using base, and things were looking great. However, the reality of our component catalog, combined with so much tech depth, was actually restricting our adoption in production to less than 50%. Components that designers were using were either not built or they were missing specific functionality in code, all due to the lack of upfront alignment on scope, priorities, and timelines within our team. And these conflicts were, we were experiencing were nothing new. Methodologies like the software development lifecycle and semantic versioning are established practices within engineering teams designed to address them. So it only felt natural to lean in on them when creating our own. We defined the component lifecycle to standardize the component creation process. And we had a couple of goals in mind. One, reduce stress and confusion. Two, improve agreement between designers and engineers. And then also, try to spe speed up prioritization, help us plan our roadmaps a little bit better, and increase efficiency and velocity over time. Our lifecycle consists of seven stages tied to a comprehensive checkpoint process. Establishing checkpoints allows us to involve stakeholders at the right time and ensure testing and quality standards are met during our releases. And standardizing this process also helps us make better upfront choices as a team by avoiding wasting time on components that are either infeasible or incompatible. What this means for component architecture is so much more upfront time spent with engineering. Discussions on defining an API can happen in parallel with building out the first version of a Figma component, giving ample time for collaboration and understanding of the constraints and best practices on each platform. We also started implementing a release cycle with corresponding staging environments to vet, release, and sometimes remove solutions. And with each release, quality and stability increase as we test with a wider audience. Releases, coupled with API tokens, empowered us with fine-grained control over component features, serving as a reliable source of truth. And with this level of control, we can then effectively scope, prioritize, and communicate the progress of our work to consumers, significantly reducing the time it takes for critical functionality to reach them. Furthermore, API tokens play a vital role in setting expectations by making availability information available through our documentation and our tooling, enabling us to communicate feature timelines effectively. Now, enhancing our existing workflows with API tokens is only the beginning. 
This journey has been a new chapter of evolution for our design system, and we're so excited to continue iterating and pushing the boundaries of the concepts and processes we shared with you today. I also want to emphasize that change at scale is really, really difficult. Reaching maturity in an almost complete component catalog comes with the expectation that we're not really rewriting our library every year, right? But if we get re hit reset on our design system today, we'd balance creating components to drive adoption and efficiency with investing in our system of systems to ensure longevity and quality of our designer and developer experiences. So wherever you are in your design systems journey, here are some things to think about to start implementing to move towards a more API-driven design system architecture. Firstly, are you confident in how your system works? Understanding how a component moves from design to code to client is the first step in better understanding the specific needs and constraints of your system, therefore enabling you to create better solutions for it. And if you're not familiar with APIs and the idea of an API token sounds a little bit scary, try creating a mock API when building out your next component. This can be something as simple as a table where you write out how you think a component would work and what variables you can leverage to define the logic. Then grab your closest engineer, maybe a box of tissues, and start learning together. Lastly, embrace the technical nature of your design system and borrow established processes to better operationalize your team. The process of becoming a true equal partner to engineering has also been a huge journey of growth for myself. Working on various initiatives from refactoring complex components to redesigning our color scale has taught me that although I come into most projects with a very strong opinion and perspective, I'm usually wrong. And however, being wrong and open to learn and shift your perspective actually allows you to build expertise and promote a culture of continual knowledge sharing amongst others in your circle. All the mistakes I've made and all the questions I've asked, even if rhetorical or seemingly pointless, also contribute to building trust. Trust can create a safe space for experimentation and making mistakes, and ultimately invites others into your process. Now, I can confidently lead even without having all the answers, continuously building my social influence and driving the standard for design quality. And best of all, familiarizing myself with enough fancy engineering terms did fool a couple of other engineers that I'm one of them. I even convinced them that I will not break our entire library if I change a couple of variables in our theming files. And before I go, I wanted to share one piece of parting wisdom from one of our engineers who is sitting right in front of me. Um, when I first told him that I'm giving this talk, he told me that no matter how hard you try, engineers will always find a reason to cry. So I guess the least we can do is at least give them the tissue, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Maria. Um, hearing you talk about speaking engineers' language is really speaking my language. It's such a power move to close the gap between design and dev, and there's so much more that we can do once we close that gap. We all know there can be conflicts in the language we use between design and code, lack of clarity or understanding, but designers and engineers really can be best friends. It's okay to ask questions and make mistakes, but invite others to participate in your process helps build trust and credibility. Next up, we have Sam, who is a product designer for Einstein, AI, and ML at Salesforce. We all know that designing for a highly technical product and working with technical stakeholders is very difficult. Sam is going to share some amazing approaches she's used to help close that gap and facilitate better communication and collaboration. One of those tips is she's going to tell you about the five whys, and you might find those very wise. Oh, all right, get out of your system. Oh. <laughs> but please welcome Sam to the stage. Um, and to everyone online, hello, and if my mom's watching, hi, mom. <laughs> hi, uh, my name is Som. I'm a product designer at uh, Salesforce, working on Einstein AI and machine learning tools. Um, so I design tools that help users make smarter decisions every day using artificial intelligence. So this is a safe space. Raise your hand if you've ever had a difficult time working with an engineer. 
Oh, wow, that's a lot more than I thought. Okay, cool, cool. Um, well, I have worked on many highly technical complex projects over my time, and I feel like sometimes it feels like I'm pulling teeth, if that makes any sense. Um, so one story I have, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you, is that there was one time I was onboarding to this new project. And I was super excited. I wanted to do the best job I can. And so I remember going up to the product manager and being like, hey, I just looked at this thing. I don't understand it. Would you mind you know, explaining this to me? And the only answer I ever got for a two week period was, oh yeah, it's in this documentation. Please just go and read it. And so, you know, it's 35 pages long. And <laughs> I remember making designs and then showing them in design reviews. And basically, every time I showed something, there would be something wrong with it that I didn't know or a nuance that, you know, broke the entire design. And it was just a very difficult working situation with um, that particular project. And I realized after so many of these were happening that 95% of the time, it was just because we were miscommunicating. We weren't aligning on things. Maybe I was understanding things incorrectly. And it was really just, you know, hampering with our work streams. So before I go forward, I wanted to define technical stakeholders. So a lot of people might think of this as just engineers, but it's much more broader than that. I define it as just someone that is kind of necessary to help you complete your project. So I work in artificial intelligence. A technical stakeholders that I would have are data scientists or machine learning engineers. If you work in chatbots, this will probably also include, you know, ethicists or linguists or native speakers if you're trying to translate something. And communication between designers and technical stakeholders is super important. It is the success of the project depends on it. When you communicate clearly, you align on things, you save time, money, effort, and if you're anyone like me that like takes a little bit too much pride in their design, also like a lot of heartache. <laughs> but communicating clearly, like I said, helps with all of this. It makes it a hell of a lot easier to work with anyone when you're actually speaking the same language. As designers, we think about the experience, the functionality, the accessibility. Engineers and technical stakeholders will tell you what is physically possible and where you can push the limits. Our collaboration between our two skills is what makes the best product possible. Now, it would be nice if we can just always understand each other, but that's not always the case. Um, you know, it would be nice if there was a universal translator that helps you just explain everything clearly all the time. I do find that if you have a content writer or a technical writer, they can help, but not every team has that. So what can you do? Here are some uh, frameworks and tools that I'm going to talk about today that has helped me in my career to make that understanding a lot easier. Um, I'm going to publish this talk after this where there are templates and examples and just checklists that you can start uh, to use right away. So let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about is having a beginner's mindset. Never underestimate the advantage of going to a project knowing nothing. So I have used this basically in every project I have in my career, but the example I want to give is more of a personal example. So I was an art kid that went to engineering school. To say that I was a bit underwater is an understatement. I was basically failing most of my classes. And so I would go in and I would try to understand things, build on what I know, and eventually it just got to the point where it wasn't working anymore. I remember like feeling so ashamed, just going to the TA and being like, I don't know anything. Please, can we just start from the beginning? And I went every day for three weeks, and I was starting to really understand the things that we were learning, understanding how things were connecting, what was building on top of each other. And I remember kind of an offhand comment that the TA was telling me of like, hey, you know, like the way you answer questions is kind of different. Like, you don't just ask how to solve today's homework, but you ask like more of the fundamental questions. And that was the first time I realized that going in and not knowing anything was helping me learn more than if I went in with an assumption of what that thing was. And 
to put the most important bit of the story is that that also helped me pass my classes. <laughs> so this approach of going in and checking your assumptions at the door really colors how I work with all of my uh, engineers. I go in and I try to just be as receptive as possible, try to learn this as if it's the first time I've ever heard it. And this has really opened my eyes of how much deeper you can understand a concept when you do these things in that way. When you check your assumptions at the door and just try to learn things for the first time, you're putting yourself in the shoes of someone as a user who might also be using this as the first time. It's a dangerous ex uh, expectation for you to have of your users that they already know some of the things that you know, and that's totally not true. By having this mindset, you are identifying learning curves, you're identifying obstacles, prerequisite knowledge, all these things that you feel like, oh yeah, someone should know this, but they don't. And how can you design an experience around that sort of first time learner? But when you're also like looking at this for the first time, you're also like thinking about them in different perspectives. You're identifying other ways of solving the problem, you're expanding your imagination, you're more likely to take risks, you're more likely to experiment, you're more likely to ask questions, and because of that, it just expands all the ways that you can understand these problems. Now, getting into that mindset can be kind of tricky. It definitely took me a few years to be able to kind of like reframe my questions to get in that way. So I'm gonna tell you today some of the ways that I like to do it to try to get to that sort of like learning for the first time experience. So the first way, and my favorite way to frame a question to get into this mindset is, can you help me understand? Not only are you signaling to the person you're asking that you want to understand the problem, just like how it works, but you want to understand it deeply. I find that people who work in these technical fields really, really love their job. And if you know anyone who loves their job, they love to talk about their job. <laughs> So when you, free, uh, when you frame your questions in this way, you're more likely to get a sort of paragraph long answer than sort of like a one sentence answer. And when you're trying to learn something for the first time, that is always helpful. Um, there's a Figma link here, which again, after this talk, you can go and kind of like read more about how I kind of reframe these questions. The second way I call is to act like a five-year-old, or as in traditional user research, it's called the five whys. It's asking uh, why five times and building on what you know to get to the root of the problem. This really helps you to learn what the cause of something is and helps you to kind of get into this you know, exploratory mindset. So here's a quick example of something that happens to me before. I was working at a uh, data ingestion project, so you know, taking data in large amounts, processing it. And our ingestion kept failing, and I remember asking the uh, engineers, hey, why is this ingestion failing? And he said, well, you know, the file just like can't read it properly. And I'm like, okay, well, why is the file not reading it correctly? And they're like, oh, well, you know, like in one of the numbers column, they used a period instead of a comma, and so like, the system got confused, but whatever. I'm like, okay, well that seems highly specific. Like why would someone use a period instead of a comma for all of their numbers? And they said, well, you know, that's the European format. So, you know, they do that sometimes. And I'm like, well, okay, if it's the European format and people all over Europe does it, like why don't we have a standard format for that? And basically the answer that he gave me was, well, we're an American company. <laughs> So we just never thought of it, and I'm like, well, you know, that sounds like an easy fix. <laughs> but yeah, so by asking the five whys, we were able to really just identify the root of this problem quickly, and I do find that most times you don't even need to ask it five times, just three or four times, you get your answer. The third way I like to do it is to ask them to explain it to me as an analogy. Uh, technical stakeholders kind of get stuck in their ways of explaining things. They're usually surrounded by other people who understand them you know, in the same way. But when you ask them to explain things as an analogy, it takes them out of that mindset and sort of like think of more creative ways to be able to answer the problem. I also find that when you ask them to explain something to you as an analogy, they take away all of the jargon, all the words that maybe you don't understand, and you know, put it into simpler terms. So I've had a relational database explained to me as a library system. 
I've also had the inner workings of the American retirement like system explained to me as a hair salon. I know that sounds really weird, but it actually works. And I do find that like once you start asking them questions in this way, engineers will also ask you questions and then ask you to explain them as an analogy. So now you have this two-way communication in which you're explaining things to each other in simpler ways, which just accelerates your collaboration. And the last way I like to ask questions is what ifs. Again, when you are a technical stakeholder, you kind of live and breathe in this world. You don't think about other things that could happen. When you ask things in what ifs, you're thinking about all the nuances and edge cases that, you know, a person who works in it might miss just because, you know, they're not thinking about it. By asking them what ifs with all these, like, you know, random, holistic, sort of like unusual expectations or experiences, you're gonna get a lot more potential scenarios than just asking them like, what's the happy path? So again, these are my favorite four ways to kind of reframe a question to get to this beginner's mindset. Um, I'll include the cheat sheet in the Figma file. So after you kind of like learn about, you know, these things for the first time, now you gotta get the project kick started. And this is when I like to use the second thing, which is a design kickoff. Um, I kind of look at them, you know, less as sort of like, we're getting started, but more of just a time to set expectations, determine baseline knowledge, and to communicate process. So why is this important? Well, it's actually kind of funny and also sad how many times you go into a meeting and you don't actually know why you're meeting. <laughs> So by setting the goal at the very beginning of this design kickoff process, you're determining what you're aligning to. What is the goal post that you're all aiming for? And once you determine that, then you can determine, okay, now what does everyone know about this goal that we're working to? Everyone's coming from different perspectives, everyone has a different background. By kind of setting this baseline knowledges, it can help you establish knowledge gaps, expectations, resources, you know, who should we connect to, next steps, and things like that. By combining your goals and your baseline knowledge at the very beginning of this design kickoff process, you're also letting them know this is what we're aiming for. Now let's drive the conversation of how we're going to get there. And this is when we get to the third process, the, the third part of this process, which is talking about the actual process. So now you have your designers, your technical stakeholders, your PMs or whatever, and sometimes the engineers have never worked with a designer before. This happens to me a lot, and when they don't know how to work with you, they don't know how to succeed with you. They don't know what requirements you need, they don't know what the review process looks like, they don't know like, you know, how long does it actually take to have this thing reviewed by content. So this is when you should take the opportunity to kind of give them a glimpse of like, okay, these are the timelines that we're working with. When we collaborate with each other, this is the type of feedback I like to have. Establishing that working style and working relationship will help with collaboration and thus drive your process further than any sort of next steps you can have following your design kickoff. So I'm not gonna go through the full story, but this is uh, some of the things that we were able to achieve within a week of having a design kickoff. And it's really important to be able to have it just because, again, it is driving your momentum as you start this project. Any sort of technical project I've ever worked on has always been hardest to kind of get things kicked off the ground. And so when you have a successful design kickoff, you have this successful momentum that then drives you through the rest of the project, which, as we all know, the middle part of the project is always the hardest. So designing a successful design kickoff can sometimes feel a little intimidating, kind of almost feels like a design project in of itself. So I've included a checklist of how to design a successful design kickoff, which I hope you can use as sort of a guideline. So now your project has been kicked off. You're getting into the weeds of things, you're talking about detail and there's that just one thing you just don't understand. Through all the words in the world, you just don't get it. And the first thing I always ask my engineers to do is, can you please just draw it out for me? <laughs> can you just like draw what you're talking about? And for me as a designer, and just like as someone who's always been more drawn to the visual arts, 
Putting pen to paper has always been way easier than trying to describe something. To me, it was the fastest way to communicate an idea from one person to another. However, I do find that technical stakeholders and engineers for some reason just are not drawn to that. They like don't want to draw things for you. They don't want to like tweak things or comment or just like make their own version. And I have a hunch on why that happens. I think it's because we show them drawings that are too nice. They have an expectation <laughs> that drawing is this like finished wireframe that you can click and looks beautiful. Like you look it on your phone, I'm like, wow, this is real. And I think that just makes them really scared to draw things when it really shouldn't be. And so the first thing that I have started doing that has helped a lot is to draw them bad pictures. <laughs> Just using shapes and arrows and like scribbles to express the idea that I want. And by having that sort of like unpolished version, you're leading them by example that this is what a drawing could be. Another way that I've found has been helpful is to actually not even call it a drawing. I found that like asking uh, my engineers, hey, can you diagram that for me? Can you whiteboard for me? These are words that they're more familiar with, and it's more likely for them to actually engage with you in creating visual artifacts. Again, I didn't call it a drawing, see that? <laughs> but with these two tweaks, I find that now they're way more likely to comment on things, draw things, they'll like send me screenshots or like pictures on Slack of like the worst drawing I've ever seen in my life. But it gets the idea across so much faster. And now the, I, the technical stakeholders and I, we have this communication, this two-way talking where we have the same sort of understanding and it's also changed my relationship with drawing in general. Now I view drawing as less sort of like a representation of a solution, that this is what something should be, but rather as an artifact to drive conversation. That is where iteration happens most times anyways, by those discussions, those debates, those like arguments about things that you have no idea why you are passionate about. But that is where it moves the product forward and that is now how I view drawings. But to say that words are not important is also completely false. We live in a world now where words are so much more important. I work in AI and one word can mean an entire field. And words are language. And when you're learning a new language, it's really hard. So for just in the room, who here knows the difference between hue and saturation? Just a raise of hand. Yeah, I'm guessing are you all also like graphic designers or? <laughs> yeah, okay. So for people like us, it's like native. You know exactly what it is. You have no idea how anyone else can think differently. But I can guarantee you, most engineers would just say these are two words to describe color and that's the only thing they know about it. And that's okay. It's because all of these words are an alien language to them. They don't use it every day. They don't know what it is. And it's very much the same process when working with engineers and they're talking about things like augmented retrieval technology. Like, learned that last week, by the way. <laughs> so it's a language. And when you learn a new language, what do they always tell you to do? To have a terminology sheet, to write down the words you don't know, and to you know, write down with the meaning, where is it used, where is it going, you know, what other things could they mean? Is this synonyms or something like that? And not only will you start learning the same words as your technical stakeholders and be able to hold conversations with them that are productive, it'll actually help you in your workflow way more than you think. So something that happened to me early on is that we were working on a project in which three features were coming into one thing. And it was a Frankenstein monster <laughs> where Th there were three teams, there was like 100 people, and I was just getting very confused whenever I was in the meeting. I have no idea what they're talking about. And so I created a terminology sheet just to get things straight. I'm like, okay, when they talk about this, they mean this thing, they talk about this, they mean this thing. But then I came across labeling issues. 
I found out that there were words that we were using that meant different things. I found out that we were talking about the same thing, but using different words. And then I found that we were using words in one page and then nowhere else in all this like unified work that we were trying to do. And so I was able to bring this to the team and we were able to establish like, oh, this is like a problem. We don't have a unified language and let's fix this labeling issues even before the design process was getting started. And so not only were we able to identify these labeling issues, we were able to create a unified language that then the three teams could work around and create momentum and then drive conversations effectively. So we weren't just like arguing about what are we talking about. So that's how having a terminology sheet will help you not only in your workflow, but also understanding things with your technical stakeholders. And sort of like a little thing that I found out as I was working on this was that as our team grew and shrank, it was a document that we could change, not change, that we could give to new team members coming in. And instead of having this tribal data, tribal knowledge where we're just like, you know, okay, here's three hours. We're gonna tell you all the things that mean on this, you know, product that we're working on. We could hand them over this document and say, like, here's our shared language. Go learn this and you'll be able to talk to us and you'll be able to understand what is happening. And it's a little bit like design karma. That's kind of how I ended up thinking about it. Uh, here's a format that I like to use. Obviously, you can use whatever terminology sheet format you would like to have, um, but hopefully that will work. And the last framework I like to use is having an open questions sheet. The truth about working in you know, the next generation of products is that you're probably gonna have a lot of questions that no one knows the answer to. And these are the things you have to keep top of mind as you're designing things, just so that you know what you're gonna work on next. But I do find that sometimes you end up with a million questions in your head and you don't know where to start, you, you know, who do I work with? What do I start working on today? And it's almost like paralysis of choice. And so I make an open questions sheet. Um, you can make it on a Google Doc or whatever doc that you use, but I do a little bit twist on it. I usually ask for a 10 minute meeting and in the first five minutes, I ask everyone to write all their questions down on the fake jam. And in the next five minutes, we talk about it. And then we do something with it. So you can map it, you can categorize it, you can put it in themes. Maybe there's questions that are similar to each other so you group them into bigger questions. Or the way I like to do it is, is to like put them on different matrices to like determine prioritization. I find that just like once all those questions are out of my head and on this central place, the possibilities open up about how you can solve them together. And probably my best favorite thing about them is that now you are literally on the same page with all the same open questions. So these are all the communications tools that I've used in my career that has really helped with clearing up communication between designers and technical stakeholders. As we design tools, we have to remember that tools also design human behavior around us. Whether you're building complex codes or, you know, the next shopping cart or something. It's our responsibilities as designers to understand what we're making and to trans that and translate that clearly to our users. But through using these design tools, it's also helped me learn how important it is that not only are we understanding our engineers clearly, but that our technical stakeholders understand us clearly. As I've started using these tools with my technical stakeholders, they have started using them on me. And now we have this changed relationship like the drawing where we're kind of like talking in a more unified language and in a more unified way. And it's just led to better collaboration and better products in general. So thank you for coming today. Um, I hope you find the links helpful and I really appreciate you for coming. Thank you.